We have been talking about John 17 a lot for the last four Sundays, but there are some parts of it that we haven't actually looked at very carefully toward the latter part of the chapter. So this morning we're going to look at verses 15 through 19, and then Lord willing, the next three Sundays I'll preach on verse 22, 24, and 26, and then we'll be done with this this series. So look with me beginning at verse 13 in John 17, and we'll read down through verse 19. Jesus says to the Father in this prayer, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Set them apart, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Verses 15 through 19 is primarily what we'll focus on this morning. You'll want to use that uh, insert that was in your worship guide uh, to follow along. Question number one is, what is the danger? Of course, this will be very familiar to you. We've seen it many times the last few weeks. But verse 15, he says, Jesus says to the Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. When we came across that the first time six weeks ago, I noted that that could be translated evil or evil one. The Greek doesn't tell us. Based on the the very clear parallel in 1 John that says evil one, that's probably the best translation here. Um, But what does the evil one want to do? He wants to get you involved in evil. So there's no no reason to try to pull apart evil and the evil one. They they go together. So uh, over the past few weeks in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Peter, 1 John, 2 Peter and Jude, God's word has called us again and again to be alert, to be careful because of evil and the evil one. It is, it is a real danger that is so significant that it stands at the center of Jesus' prayer for us. We should also remember, we haven't actually mentioned this any of these weeks, that this is part of how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Remember that part of what we call the Lord's Prayer? Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from? And it's, it's the same term. You could translate it evil or you could translate it evil one. Pray that God would deliver you from the evil one. We, we know, really, we got to admit that we know so little about the spiritual realm, yet we can be certain that the Bible tells us everything we need to know about the spiritual realm. <clears throat> and so what I want to do this morning before we move on past verse 15 is, is just kind of summarize some of the key truths about the evil one. There is so much uh, misunderstanding, I think, about this and confusion or maybe even fear at times certainly mockery and scorn from the world about this. So let's just talk in general. We can't cover everything the Bible says, but we've, it's come up week after week, after, and I just want us to kind of land for a few minutes here and talk about our foe. So let me ask this question first. What are some of Satan's methods? What are some of his methods? And, and the, the thing about Satan is that he hates the truth, because whenever truth triumphs, he loses. And so that's why John, Jesus said in John 8 that he's a, he's a liar. His nature is to lie. And he, he only has power when people don't know or believe what is true. And, and so he is, he is a deceiver who is on a massive campaign to keep the truth covered up. You know, our world is full of people trying to cover things up, trying to cover up the skeletons in their closet at home. For some people, they're trying to cover up the real skeletons in their backyard. Um, There are politicians and athletes and things that are trying to cover up corruption. But nobody has a bigger cover-up going on than Satan does as he desperately tries to cover up the truth. Every time God saves a person, truth triumphs over deception. Acts 26, to open their eyes 
so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Jesus said in John 8 that truth sets people free. Satan doesn't want anybody to be free, so he doesn't want anyone to know truth, right? So for example, he promotes false doctrines from smooth teachers who sound trustworthy. Jesus says, false prophets will arise to deceive, if it was possible, even the elect. Paul says that there are doctrines of demons, yet is that what they sound like? They work because they sound good. Sometimes they're backed up by people who say they're using the Bible. So he promotes doctrinal lies and deceptions. He promotes philosophical lies and deceptions. Just um, don't do this, but if you turned on daytime TV and just browsed the channels and watched what's in there, you would get a truckload of philosophy that is not true about how you should live from talk show hosts and whatever, whatever else. We were uh, last night at Menifee's birthday party. Some Buddhists had a booth, and I heard an older man, one of that Buddhist group, talking to a group of teenage girls and telling them, if you, I don't know, say these words or something, um, you'll, you'll find the right boyfriend and get better grades. I thought, did I just hear that? That's not true. If they trust in that, they are trusting in deception. Satan also promotes moral lies and deception. Remember that Paul told the Thessalonians, to abstain from evil, no matter how it appears, any form that evil takes. Satan takes what is morally evil and hides it under an appealing disguise. And I'm going to take a little bit of a sidetrack here. I mean, it's very directly relevant, but there's an article I read a few months ago that I've been waiting for a good opportunity to mention to you, and I, I think this is a good place for it because we're saying that Satan promotes moral deception, okay? Okay. I came across an article by a filmmaker. He's the director of the longest running um, uh, film festival in America, in San Francisco. And he wrote an article for filmmakers titled 17 Things About the Film Biz Business That Should Significantly Influence Your Behavior. And his first 14 things on his list were everything that's wrong with the film business that make it terribly hard for anybody to make a living. And um, uh, so he was... I think cautioning people, you might not want to head this direction for a career <laughs> because it's a mess. That was the first 14 of his 17 points. Point 17 was, um, there has never been a better time to be involved in filmmaking. Okay, so how did we get from 14 reasons why it's, it's, it's an industry that's terrible to make a living in to the film business is awesome? Uh, point 16 was that movies create a shared emotional response amongst all those that view it simultaneously. What other product can claim that? But then what really caught my attention was number 15. And I'll just read his paragraph first. Movies have a unique capacity to create empathy for people and actions we don't know or have not experienced. Science has shown that something we imagine releases a similar chemical response to the actual experience. If this empathic experience is virtually unique to film, can it be utilized more? I think so, tremendously so, in fact. And then he says, so filmmaking is a great industry to get into. Um, so he's saying, movies are so powerful because without even thinking about it, we tend to deeply empathize with what we see. So maybe your family watches a movie about a Civil War nurse who risked her life to tend to wounded soldiers, or a family who helps, helped hide Jews in Eastern Europe, or, or a professor who gave up a good salary and retirement package to go teach in Africa. You watch that and your heart share in that together, and that, that movie creates empathy for those people and what they did, and lights and lenses and background music and acting and editing all comes together powerfully, and you, you are moved to think very favorably of those people. And there are, there are people that are missionaries or nurses or teachers to a significant degree because of something they watched when they were young. 
you know, that just deeply moved them in that direction. So then what about those movies and TV specials and things in which the lights and lenses and background music and acting and editing are all harnessed together to portray something like euthanasia or adultery in a positive way? Then what happens? That creates a shared emotional response among the viewers, a powerful empathy for what you might not have experienced yourself. So maybe... You have never committed adultery, but if it's as cool as it looked in that movie, if it's that exciting and that satisfying, and if it ends so happily, then maybe, maybe, maybe God was wrong about this. Maybe it's not so bad. Now, if I think that way, what just happened? Satan just deceived me. He took a moral evil and portrayed it in such a way that I came to the conclusion that it is a good thing. So Satan promotes doctrinal, philosophical, moral lies and deception. He promotes what is false and covers up what is true. And we should recognize that his deception is much more skillful than our discernment. Some of you even think of yourself as a person who has discernment or even the gift of discernment. And I would just caution you, (laughs) caution you. We can get tricked by his schemes. We can start to live or think in a way that's actually ungodly. And we don't even realize that we've drifted into a worldly way of thinking. Let me give you just a very simple, very practical example of something that's not bad, but it was a, and I I think I might have shared this with you before, but it was a point in my life where I realized I had been just thinking the way the world was telling me to think, which wasn't all wrong, but it could have become wrong, okay? Um, So I was 24, probably, and was in uh, Northern California visiting a, a pastor who has pastored a, um, it's a Spanish-speaking congregation east of the Bay Area. And he was, they were missionaries in Spain first, and then they, they, they have a large, a pretty good-sized um, Spanish-speaking church um, in the, up east of the Bay Area. And we uh, went to their house after church that evening, and um, uh, the house that they were renting, and um, I don't know how I found out, but he, somehow it came up that they'd never bought a house. And never owned a house. And um, he was probably in his mid-50s. And I remember thinking, you're in your mid-50s and you've never bought a house. You can't do that. You can't be in your mid-50s and have no equity and have never bought a house. Now, why did I think that way? Well, okay, you realize what I'm saying here. There is some wisdom in buying a house and things like that. But I had been so trained to think that way, the world's thinking about how money has to work, that it had never crossed my mind until I sat on the couch in his living room. And I remember his living room vividly because it was such a powerful moment. It had never crossed my mind that God might want me to live in an apartment my whole life and that would be okay. Never crossed my mind. I just kind of bought the American dream thing, right? My point is not about houses. My point is just that it was a moment when I went, whoa, I never thought of that before. I just always thought the way the culture told me to think, which is you buy a house and, and whatever. You see what I'm saying? So my point is just that his, his deception can be more skillful than our discernment. And we, we have to, that's why the Bible is so important. We need God's truth. We need the only place We can know what is true is what God says. Satan hates truth. I've been working through Proverbs 1 and 2, and which, you know, call us to pursue wisdom. And I was struck this week by a line in Proverbs 2, 3. It says, if you cry for discernment. And I thought, wow, do I cry for discernment? As I live in this world with the God of this world, 
do I cry out to God for discernment? So we've been talking about Satan's methods, which always have to do with lying and deceiving and disguising because he hates the truth that sets people free. But, and there's more we could say about his methods, but what is his goal? What is Satan's goal? And we could say that a lot of ways too. Um, one goal is that we would perish, right? He is called Apollyon, destroyer. He knows his doom is sure, and he'd like to take as many people with him as possible. So one of his goals is that we would perish. Another goal is that we would sin. We, we've seen that John says, whoever commits sin is of the devil. He, he tempted Eve. He tempted Jesus. The prince of the power of the air works in the children of disobedience, and they live in the lusts of their flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. He wants us to sin. But I think what the Bible says most clearly is that Satan's goal is to defeat our faith. Without faith, we perish, right? Those who don't believe perish. Without faith, we sin. And so his goal is to defeat our faith. So 1 John 5 says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, yet this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Satan desired to sift Peter, but Jesus prayed that what would not fail? His faith. Ephesians 6 says, take up what shield? The shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Be sober and on the alert. The devil wants to devour you, 1 Peter 5, but resist him firm in your faith. Satan attacks you with lies and deceptions and disguises to lead you away from trusting God. Yet, it is also possible for Satan to actually flee from us. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I love that verse. James makes spiritual warfare really simple because you know what the first half of the verse is? Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submitting to God and resisting the devil are two sides of the same coin. You resist the devil by trusting God, by believing him, by submitting in him. That makes spiritual warfare really simple. Submit to God and the devil will flee. That word is just packed full of encouragement for us. The, the devil cannot stand the presence of the simplest Christian who is gladly trusting God, treasuring God's promises, and submitting to God. He can't stand it. He flees. He flees from them, and he looks for opportunities with others. You know, Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity and it's interesting, after Satan tried and failed to tempt Jesus, it says when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. So you see two different ways. Satan, Satan can be fleeing from you or he can be coming towards you because he sees an opportunity. He looks for opportunities, opportune times. And if we just keep loving and trusting God, he's going to have a hard time finding any opportunities. He's going to spend most of his time fleeing for you. It's, it's hard. <clears throat> Have you? Okay, so he throws fiery darts, right? How, how effectively could I throw a dart backwards at someone if I'm running away from them? That's pretty hard to do. If he is fleeing, he's going to have a difficult time throwing fiery darts at your faith. So love God's word and believe what God says and submit to him. And Satan flees. That actually leads then to our second question. What means does the Father use to keep us? So look back at John 17 again now <clears throat> and verse 15. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Remember again, you know, we've had two key words in the prayer of Jesus, keep and set apart. And the word sanctify in verse 17 is that word that means to set apart. So verse 16 says we're not of the world. 
And that's why in verse 17, Jesus prays for us to be set apart from the world. So the Father will set us apart, but what will he use? The answer in verse 17 is not any surprise at all, right? If Satan hates truth, then what is God going to use to set you apart from the evil one in the evil world? Truth, right? So set them apart in the truth. And where's the truth? Your word is truth. I love the simplicity of that. Satan is trying to keep you in his world or draw you into his world with deception and lies and disguises. And God is keeping you set apart by the truth, the truth of his word. Every, every time you're in your Bible or listening to teaching or something and you're reminded of a promise of God, every time something in the word strengthens your struggling faith, every time the word um, cautions you or warns you about a, a danger, every time those things happen, God is keeping you. He's using the word to set you apart. He's using the word to keep you. And Satan is fleeing. And the father is answering the prayer of the son. That's all happening every time, God, you come to the word and it encourages you or it challenges you or it it helps you. To resist the devil, love God's word. (laughs) To give the devil an opportunity, neglect God's word. Something I love about verse 17 is that Jesus assumes, because he knows, that the word of God is going to be available for every generation of followers of Jesus. Otherwise, how could this have any meaning? How could God set us apart in the truth of his word if we didn't have his word? But what did Jesus promise in John 14 through 16? That he'd give the Spirit, that he'd bring to their remembrance all the things that Jesus had taught, that the Spirit would testify with them. The word of God would be inspired and now has been preserved. So that 2,000 later, years later in California, guess what the Father's still doing? Keeping us with his word. Jesus knew that would happen. Jesus made that happen as he sent the Spirit. So the means that the Father uses is the word of truth. Now our third question is, uh, why are we here? And Jesus answers that in uh, verse 18, but look first at verse 15. Remember he said in verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. What a great moment (laughs) when the son says to the father, I'm not praying for this. Don't take them out of the world. But verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. We are here because Jesus sent us here. And um, so if, if Jesus wanted the Father to keep us safe so that we won't perish, but we'll be with him forever, then he should just take us out of the world. That would guarantee it, right? Just as soon as, that would be such an easy way to know who's been truly saved. (laughs) Just there they go. (laughs) But if that, if the Father did that, verse 20 would never happen. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. If the Father just took us out of the world, no one would ever believe through our word. The entire world would be lost and condemned. Jesus sent us into the world on a mission. Now, let me just give you six brief thoughts about what that mission means for us. You could add more things to this list, but again, I'm partly just trying to summarize some of what we've seen the last few weeks. Number one, This mission means love. It's a mission of love because Jesus says in verse 18 that he sends us into the world as the Father sent him into the world. How did the Father send him? Send him. For God so loved the world that he gave, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. So when Jesus says, Father, don't take them out of the world, that's an expression of love for the world. He's leaving us here out of love for them, that we might take the word of truth to them. You know, the God of this world doesn't love anyone except himself. The world gets every dollar it can from people and then dumps them. It's a a consumer world we live in. If it makes money, do it. If it doesn't make money, stop. And if you can get money from someone, then great. And if you can't, then who needs them anymore? I mean, that's been the experience of so many, like, athletes. 
get a big contract, make a bunch of money, have a ton of friends, finish your career, didn't take good care of your money, money's all gone, where did all my friends go? Right? The world gets all it can out of people and then it dumps them. The people of this world are not loved by the God of this world, but the true God loves them. And we're on a mission from Him, so we love them. You see, we hate the God of this world and the perversions and the deceptions, but we love the people who are being deceived and corrupted and destroyed. So this mission, number one, means love. Um, And by the way, I don't have time. We don't have time to go look at this text, but you could write down 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, where Paul tells Timothy about the right attitude toward people who are opposing the truth. All right, so the mission means love, but number two, it also means contact. As we said back in John 15, if your life does not include opportunities for unsaved people to see your Christ-like life and for you to speak about Christ to unsaved people, you've put your lamp under a table or under a basket. You are too isolated. The mission means contact. Number three, the mission means caution. And we've talked about this plenty. God's Word says, be alert, be sober, be vigilant, be (laughs) vigilant. Be diligent. I'm making up words this morning. Being sent into the world demands caution, and we saw that in just so many of the passages we've looked at the last few weeks. Number four, being sent into the world means armor. Jesus provided for us a full set of armor as described in Ephesians chapter 6, and he knows what he's doing, right? He didn't mess up in in the armor that he gives us. And, and, And so when he tells us in Ephesians 6, put it all on. You know, he means it. We need all of the armor that he's given us. And then being sent into the world, number five, also demands prayer. That's obvious because we're in John 17 and Jesus is praying. The Father would keep us in the world. And he told us to pray it in the Lord's Prayer. It's in Ephesians 6 too, at the end of the armor section, Ephesians 6, 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit and be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So being here in this world demands prayer. And then finally, being sent into the world demands the church. Satan deceives, right? Hebrews 3, 13, encourage one another <clears throat> so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. <clears throat> Your church family helps to protect you from deception. Which deer does the wolf follow? Which antelope does the lion stalk? It's the one who's separated from the pack. It's the one who's away from the family. What people does the roaring lion of this world seek to devour? The ones who are away from the pack and separated from their family. Because we are sent into this world, we need the church. All right, now our final question is, is this really possible? (laughs) Is it really possible to make it? Is it really possible to be kept? Is it really possible to be set apart? Um, You know, when God tells us, (laughs) when God tells us that we're like sheep among wolves and that there's a roaring lion trying to devour us and that fiery darts are being thrown at us, he's not mincing words. I mean, he's he's clearly trying to get our attention. And uh, I don't think we're supposed to respond casually to those kind of, those kind of, images. But, but then we come back then to the promises, right? And we find another one in John 17, verse 19, when Jesus says, for their sakes, I set apart myself that they themselves also may be set apart in truth. Is it Is it really possible for us to survive the world and the evil in our own flesh and the attacks of the devil? Yes, it's possible, but only because Jesus set himself apart. That's the only reason it's possible. But what does that mean? Well, um, there are a few possibilities there, but I think that our clearest clue is back in John 10 when Jesus said that he was set apart and sent into the world by the Father. And I think that means that the Father set Jesus apart for this mission of coming into our world to attack the domain of Satan and rescue captives from his power. The Father set Jesus apart for that mission. And then here in verse 19, what Jesus is saying is that he responded by setting himself apart 
for that mission, for the Father's will, for the Father's purposes. He says in the Gospel of John so many times, I just came to do what the Father wants me to do. I just came to do His will. I'm just here for His purposes. So Jesus set Himself apart for the Father's will and mission. He came and took on Him humanity, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Think about this. Jesus didn't believe any of the lies or fall for any of the temptations of the world. What would have happened if He did? What would have happened if Jesus had been corrupted with just a little bit of worldly thinking? Would He still have come not to be served but to serve? Would He still have spent those grueling days of hot, dusty ministry among unruly crowds? Do, Do you ever have a pity party for yourself? Anyone ever have pity parties? What if Jesus had had a pity party? I mean, the God of glory here among us, grumpy, messy people, what if he would have just had just enough worldly thinking to allow a pity party for himself? Would he have accepted the mockery and scorn of his enemies and prayed for the Father to forgive them? Would he have died on the cross had there been any worldly thinking in Jesus? You see, he had completely set himself apart to the Father's will, the Father's way, the Father's plan. Praise God he did. He did die and conquer the power of Satan and defeat death and hell. And through those things, what verse 19 is telling us is that through those things, he made it possible for us to be set apart. He gave himself for our sins. Galatians 1.4, he gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. You are a sheep among wolves, and there is a roaring lion who wants to devour you, and fiery darts are being thrown at you, but greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. This is the power of the cross. The darts can't kill. The lion can't devour. The wolves can't destroy those who are in Christ, because Jesus set himself apart perfectly to do the Father's will. So do you see that meaning in verse 19? Jesus set himself apart from any worldly ways of living or thinking to do the Father's will all the way to the point of death and the cross and victory over Satan. That's what makes it possible for us now to be set apart. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, Christ Jesus became to us sanctification. He became to us set-apartness. He is our sanctification. If you have Jesus, we say this a lot, right? If you have Jesus, you have everything. If you have Jesus, you have everything. If you have Jesus, you have sanctification. Now, that's a point at which some people have really gotten messed up, and they have said, well, then, if we have Jesus, we have everything, and if we have Jesus, we have sanctification, then all we have to do is claim our sanctification by faith, and from then on, we'll never sin. That's the doctrinal foundation of the belief that um, Christians should, reach, should live a life, a sinless life. And, and what was taught... Um, especially in the Bible conference movement in the 19th century, was that you just need enough faith to claim it. So if you're still sinning, you clearly don't have enough faith to believe that Jesus is your sanctification. To claim your full sanctification, then you never sin again. So I'm saying that partly to warn you against that teaching because it has been taught by uh, a lot of Christian teachers. The Bible tells us so clearly that the working out of our set-apartness in our lives is a long process that involves things like being diligent and being vigilant and letting the Word of Christ richly dwell within us. So so Christ is our sanctification. Don't conclude that if you would just believe in Him enough, you would never sin again and you'd be perfect. But do conclude that the power of set-apartness is completely available to you. All that you need is in Jesus. Remember, that's what Peter told us in 2 Peter 1. All things pertaining to life and godliness have been granted to us in His promises. And the promise of set-apartness is yours too. He's going to do it. The Father is going to answer the prayer of the Son because of the work of the Son. So hopefully we answered that question, is it possible? Is it really possible? It's possible because Christ is your sanctification. All right, I just want to say this in conclusion. There are two lions in the New Testament. One is a devouring lion who deceives 
and destroys. The other is a lion who is also a lamb who took our death to give us life. Which lion are you loyal to? Which lion do you listen to? Which one do you trust? But remember this. One of those two lions flees from the other. So if you want him to flee from you, then stay very close to Jesus. Thank you.